Welcome to the Green Enterprise Podcast. I'm Leonard Alf, its host. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, entitled Sustainable Healthcare in a Carbon Neutral World. You can find these conversations on YouTube, iTunes, and Spotify, and follow our work at gre-enterprise.org. What follows is a conversation with David Pension. Dr. Pension is the founder and ex-director of the NHS Sustainable Development Unit, which today coordinates the world's most ambitious initiatives to make healthcare sustainable. He helped found the unit in April 2008 and has been the author of innumerable leading academic reports, articles, book chapters, and a book on sustainable healthcare since. In 2012, he was awarded an Order of the British Empire Award for services to public health and the NHS. And today he's the associate and honorary professor at the University of Exeter. I'm also delighted to be co-hosting today's conversation with Jatin Naidu, a medical student and researcher at University College London, a brilliant and interdisciplinary thinker. thinker. Jatin is interested in themes ranging from fighting healthcare inequalities to designing equitable healthcare systems from a global public policy perspective. Currently, he's working on a novel SARS COVID test at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children. He's also, notably, the head of the Green Enterprise Institute's healthcare department. On that note, a brief thought on today's theme. Sustainable health systems are key to maintaining societal health, welfare, and in turn to spurring on economic development and growth. The sector contributes an estimated 5% of the world's carbon footprint every year. And that not only means that it's incredibly important that we address key issues within the sector, it also means that to the degree that, that all the industries within the global economy are interrelated, addressing healthcare sustainability can be an important leverage point for overall decarbonization. Therefore, from a green enterprise perspective, healthcare sustainability may be the key to understanding how public coordination and private innovation can deliver high quality, reliable, and affordable resources and services with no net zero, with no net environmental cost. Um, in the conversation that is to follow, we put, touch upon many themes. These include medical ethics, procurement practices, development, economics, and most importantly, sustainable care. But for me, a significant takeaway from my conversation with Dr. Pension has been that all of the issues relating to the climate climate crisis, and um, despite being interrelated, are also incredibly complicated, much more, much more so than they seem. Um, and they require the type of nuanced thinking displayed by today's guest. That said, I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Dr. Pension, for joining us today. Um, it's great to be with you. Very happy to join you. So I'd like to get into our conversation with something you know, relatively easy. Later on, we'll, we'll be trying to delve into some more complicated concepts. Um, in the meantime, just like to hear from you, how is it that your career in healthcare transitioned to sustainability? What was the progression there? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So I'm, I'm sort of semi-retired at the moment, but ever since I was young, I mean very young, when I was a kid, I was always interested in the environment. I, I can't tell you why, I just was, that was the way it was. And I was interested in things like nuclear power and, and acid rain and the issues of my time in the 60s and 70s. Um, and I was quite active as an adolescent as well um, in in organizations like Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace, nothing, nothing unusual there. But then I went to medical school and so-called got a proper job. And I, weirdly, I sort of stopped doing sustainability and climate action for about 30 years. Now that's an interesting question. Why did I stop doing it? Well, probably because I thought, well, probably because I was busy, but also because I was doing another good thing. Okay. I was, I was buying my way into heaven in a different way, I guess you might say. And then after about 20 years ago, 
uh, I just thought, wait a minute, this, the, the climate crisis, the nature crisis is of such a magnitude, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot cope with it myself without feeling I'm doing something both personally and professionally. And better still, Leonard, weaving the two together, actually, the so-called living your values at work. Um, so I started making a few noises about it at work. And of course, most people were very unreceptive to that. And then we were very lucky in the UK. We had the Climate Change Act in 2008, which sort of met. It didn't exactly mandate action by the whole public sector, but it certainly permissioned it. And, and, and public sectors were starting to hold themselves to account and it was becoming embarrassing to do nothing. So it was envis envisaged that a small unit would be set up within that, the National Health Service in England, which I was lucky enough to be recruited to and I was the founder director, to, to do something, do something. So that was, and I, I don't think anybody, including me, realized that this movement, this not just the unit, the unit's quite small, but the movement, the, almost the social movement within the health service would pick up as quickly and as dramatically as it did. I mean, that's not due to me. It, it is just the confluence of things that happened that suddenly multiplied. And it was almost like a social tipping point within the profession. And now it's not unusual for medical students or nurses or physiotherapists or managers to talk about climate change or the nature crisis is not seen as you're not seen as weird or off the wall. I mean, it is weird to some people, but I think people, at least in the health service, are starting to realize that it's not just about caring for ill people. It's about helping us keep healthy. Uh, I know that sounds very cheesy and trivial and obvious, but I don't think I don't think health professionals know much about health. I think we know a lot about illness we don't really know what causes health and and so so that's really Leonard how I got into the business or how I how the business really took off the issue really took off as a core part of the business model of what healthcare services are there to do right yeah things are changing all around us um Jatin do you have any do you have any thoughts on that yeah, so um, on the back of what you said, um, obviously when people Google your name in, um, as I did, um, you're the founder of the Sustainable Development Unit, in, which was formed in um, 2008, and the author of many official documents. Um, and so just for our viewers, really, I wanted to ask, um, could you briefly exp explain the intersectionality between health, healthcare and climate change? Yeah, no, that is a great question because... One of the problems from where I sit is that it's so obvious, and maybe for you as well, working in, in, the, in the health service, it's so obvious that you wouldn't think you need to explain it. But in fact, you do. I mean, a lot of people, smart, you know, well-educated people say to me, oh, health and climate change, and what's the connection? And of course, I'm so narrow-minded, over-focused, as you might, that you think, surely, surely, do I need to explain? Um, yeah, so the... The intersection basically is that climate change is bad for health, you know, extreme events, migration, heat waves, flooding. Climate change is also bad for the health service. It's very difficult to run a healthcare service when the hospital is being flooded or the power's down or there's a, you know, a heat wave. And thirdly, I think the third issue, Jatin, which people forget is that the health service is bad for climate change in that it's part of the problem in that it's a very high carbon business. I mean, healthcare services generally do good things, but not only do they cost a lot of money, but they cost a lot of carbon as well. So, and they produce a lot of waste. So, you know, 10 years ago, as you said, in 2008, we had to start somewhere. We had to get the conversation going in a, in a way that's, that help people engage or live their values at work, as I said. And so, so that's what we did. We, we sort of took that three-prong model and people are either interested in the effect of climate change on their health of themselves or populations, they're either, or they're interested in the effect of climate change on the health service, the healthcare service. And as you will know from your education, healthcare 
and health are two completely different things. They're not they're not similar. They're related, but they're not similar. And thirdly, which is where we focused initially, is the NHS, the National Healthcare Service in the UK, has the responsibility not only to do things to address its climate responsibility, but to be seen to be doing things as well. That was important. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good answer. I think it's I think um, it's nice for the viewers to know that it's a threefold um, uh, relationship uh, between climate change and health. Um, and I just wondered if we could add another variable in, and that's um, COVID-19. Um, and uh, I know Leonard um, attended a talk, um, which you did, and I think you uh, mentioned COVID-19 and climate change being interrelated phenomena. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, um, what do you think COVID-19 has highlighted about our sustainability um, initiatives? And do you predict this to accel um, accelerate change? Uh, well, it's certainly going to accelerate change. Whether it's going to accelerate ch the sort of change we want is another question. So I I've sort of rolled this around in my mind a lot, and I I'm not really sure what the answer is. I know, I, I think, I, or I feel a few things to, in response to your question. It it's a fairly, it's a good question. It's a very important question. The first thing I would say is that climate change and COVID are both caused, in a sense, by the same thing. That's uncontrolled unregulated, thoughtless globalization. So the fundamental, the causes are actually related. OK, um, that's a, that's a slightly tenuous relationship, but they are related. Secondly, um, the way we've reacted to COVID, because quite often in, in the human condition, it's not what happens to you as a person or a population, it's how you react to what happens to you. That's important, equally important, sometimes more important. So what COVID has shown us is that if we so wish, if we have the political and social will, we can react dramatically, well, large scale, scale and pace. So it, we've, what COVID's proven to us is that if we wish, if we have the political will, we can act together. OK, but it's all. It's also shown us that actually we don't always act together in everybody's interests. So, you know, we're, you might argue we're all in the same boat, but we're not all in the same ocean. So we're all, we're all in the same boat in terms of what we face as a threat from COVID. Um, but we don't always, we're not always in the same boat as far as the resources available to support us in vaccines or treatment or oxygen or ITU. So that's another thing. I think the third thing, Jackson, is that it shows that people will often prioritise the urgent over the important. I mean, the, the healthcare systems tend to be full of crisis junkies which love, I mean, we love crises, we love emergency, we love blue lights, we love drama. And COVID is tragic, but it's also drama. And I'm not saying anybody would wish COVID a pandemic on the globe, but it has, it has pepped everybody up. It's made people address what they're really trying to do. And we're good at emergencies, but we seem to be better at fast burn emergencies than we are at slow burn emergencies. And actually, climate change is now a fast burn emergency, but COVID is an even faster burn emergency. So both collectively and individually, we will we will always prioritise the urgent over the important. And um, I think it's really important to not to, to, to balance out. I mean, clearly, COVID is urgent, but you, you can't just then, oh, OK, well, let's put climate change to one side and come back to it in three or four years. You know, we are capable of multitasking. We are capable of understanding co-benefits. We are capable of thinking in systems if we so choose. So so, so those are just a couple of thoughts about, I mean, but I think that when you, if, if there are any historians left at the end of the 21st century, they, they will fill more pages in the history book about how we responded or didn't respond to the ecological crisis than how we did or did not respond to the COVID crisis. They're both important, but you've got to get them in proportion, both in terms of scale of mortality, scale of time, scale of action needed. 
Yeah, I think that's a very interesting point you make. Um, and, and I can certainly see the parallels you draw, um, especially when it comes to the global south and the disproportionate effects they will face from climate change and the disproportionate effects they're facing from not having vaccines for their populations. Um, and yeah, I, I completely hear you on that. Um, and I want to pass over to Leo. I think, um, yeah, he's got a of course, question. Um, uh, thank you. Um, so just, just as an interlude, um, I'd just like to, to go back to what you were saying about, um, about the interrelation between COVID and climate. Um, putting the two in proportion, certainly true. Um, we hope that the pandemic will, will in fact pass within the next few years, and th that historically that's been the case. Um, and again, as you mentioned, the study of the factors behind the climate crisis are, from a historic perspective, more important. Um, I wondered, though, and, and this is something that we've, we've been thinking about a, a little bit, um, when you look at the response, um, what went wrong in the response to the COVID crisis, and also just what, what our response to the COVID crisis revealed about the healthcare system, for example. Um, are there any takeaways, in your opinion, about, about um, how those systems work that could be improved and, and in, in, in that sense could, could address some, another crisis like the, the climate crisis better in the future? Um, well, I think... I, I'm not sure I'm an expert in this. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I think, if it's of any value. And, and I guess it's, it's not surprising, really. But there is the age old thing of how science talks to politics and how politicians are open or not open to the science. Um, I think that's been very interesting. I think a lot of a lot. There's been a lot of hot air about the causes of COVID and the assumptions and the policy decisions to be made. Um, I think it's actually quite early days to see how we've done both practically and politically with COVID. I think one of the things we possibly haven't done as well as we might have done is there's always going to be a plurality of approach. Different countries, different communities are going to react to it in a different way. Now that may paradoxically not be a bad thing because in reacting to things in a different way, it's almost like a natural experiment. We, we can learn that country A is working very well, with very much better than country B through no fault or benefit to either. But, but it, it's important that we learn from that. And we, I guess we do something politically which we do badly as human beings anyway, which is admit that we don't know everything, act on the best possible evidence and not be too... I know this last bit is difficult, and not to be too struck by your political ideology. Trying to break out of your political ideology. So, for instance, it's no surprise that, or sadly, it's no surprise that those countries with a more politically individualistic approach uh, are just UK, Brazil, US, for instance, have actually done worse than countries that had a more collective approach to it. Now, you could say that's a very politically biased comment, but I think the, I think certainly one of the really important points of your question, which maybe we're not asking ourselves enough, is what are we learning from how well or how badly we're addressing COVID? Um, and without pointing the finger or blaming or what have you. So say, let's learn from it and do exactly what you said, which is let's apply this to an even longer span, more systemic, much more wicked, a wicked, wicked issue like climate. We should be able to learn from that. I'm not sure I have any great insights now. I think it's actually slightly too early to say, but we should absolutely invest thought and time into doing that objectively and collectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, speaking of ob objectively and collectively, and, and, and actually speaking to your point about objectivity, um, I'm, I'm very happy that you, you brought up before the dual nature of, um, on, on one hand, healthcare systems being impacted by the climate crisis in the future and, and by the indirect effects that it will be sure to engender. And then on the other hand, being extraordinarily energy intensive and, and carbon intensive in its own right. 
um, and being amongst one of the the first scopes um, from a sectoral perspective that policymakers should should look to um, in order to to proceed with sector wide decarbonization. So one of the first um, one of one of the ways that I was thinking through framing this question and this theme um, that I'm that I'm kind of introducing here is a a, a financial economic idea um, about double materiality. You know, just very basic basic concept that's just recently emerged about company disclosure obligations. Um, if if the if the financial information uh, about the impacts accrued to a company from the environment are material, they should be disclosed if certain conditions are met. Double materiality is essentially the application of, of just thinking about bidirectionality, that bidirectionality that I was, um, I was speaking to in, in regards to um, the healthcare system and the environment. Um, so without getting into the, the financial concepts, that's just a that's just an idea I wanted to briefly mention in, in regards to this bidirectionality. Um, how do you conceptualize the dual relationship between um, when one might say climate mitigation and climate adaptation or resiliency in the healthcare sector? Yeah. Well, let's just let's just address that. That's a, that's quite a weighty set of questions there. Let's just address that last bit now about. Um, adaptation and mitigation. And I think, I mean, one of the ways, I mean, some people get slightly confused about them and their relationship. And I always try and simplify it by saying that, you know, adaptation is um, about managing the avoidable. And I think mitigation is avoiding the unmanageable. Um, but but there's a very serious point, actually, Leo, in, in the difference between them, because this may sound slightly controversial. And I, I, th I do think that's, there's any problem with being controversial because I think we have to sort of put our, put, our self, put our heads above the parapet. I sometimes think that adaptation can be the enemy of mitigation. Now clearly we do need to adapt to a change in climate because it is changing now. We need to adapt to it. The problem is if we invest too much in adaptation, all we will merely do is trying to protect ourselves about the inevitable cataclysm rather than stop the cataclysm happening. So it's quite difficult to do both things at the same time. Um, so we, and in this country, we had two, two completely different government departments, one doing adaptation, one mitigation. So what, what a recipe for the disaster that, that might be. Um, yeah, so this is very important. And so trying to, the way I frame it normally is to say, sure, we have to adapt but try and adapt in ways that also mitigate because there are ways of adapting that do quite the opposite. So to give you a trivial example, you could say, well, we'll adapt by just putting air conditioning in every building that exists. Now that would be just crazy. That would be crazy because you would just hike up the energy prices. It wouldn't really get you anywhere. It would give you more breathing space, which you would probably use badly. You know, people say, oh, well, we need breathing space to invent more tech. But the more breathing space you give people, the longer you stretch out the pain, really. So and I often I've often said before that climate change is happening at the most inconvenient rate. It's not happening fast enough that we act as though it's COVID. Uh, but it, unfortunately, it's acting slowly enough so that we think we can adapt to it. But it's still happening fast enough that it's going to kill us if we don't do something really dramatic. I don't mean about a little bit of greenwash and a tiny bit of efficiency. That is that is futile. I mean, we need it, but we need it along with transformational changes. And that that I think segues into your real question which is about the business model of healthcare, because a lot of people who are very active on health and climate are not people who are economically or business savvy. In fact, they're slightly ignorant of it and probably anti it really because they see business and capitalism and as, as part of the threat. But the truth is that a lot of innovations, be it in healthcare or other sectors, come not just from tech, not just from fancy, glossy new ways of doing things, but actually from novel ways of doing the present day, 
via business models, economic incentives that interweave with social change, social engineering, social tipping points. And I think that's probably where the smart money is, literally. So to give you an example that's related to healthcare, Leo, um, the healthcare system essentially monetizes illness. We make money out of illness, both in the healthcare system, but also in the ancillary industries like the pharmaceutical industry and the medtech industry. Basically, you make more and more money out of making insulin or scanners. And that's what the big companies do, and quite rightly so. And they save lives and they do great things. But we've got to get away from this model whereby we're addressing just illness, you know, that we're big illness management conglomerates rather than we create health. And, and uh, I think um, Don Berwick from the United States, one of your compatriots, would say that um, would 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 try and synthesize that notion into uh, one sentence, which would say, so I think it's a very thought provoking sentence, really, which is, if you run a hospital, for instance, I know most healthcare is not delivered in hospitals, it's delivered in primary care. But if you run a hospital, you could well have a mantra that says every unplanned admission to your hospital is a sign of system failure until proved otherwise. OK, by system, we just don't mean the healthcare system. We mean the education system, the transport system, the health and safety system, whatever it is. So any unplanned admission is a system. So what you're really trying to do is monetize health. How can companies, partners invest in health, not invest in illness management? And of course, they're not the opposite ends of the same spectrum. They are different spectrums completely. Health is not the opposite of illness, nor vice versa. Illness and health are almost orthogonal in the sense that there are plenty of people living with quite severe illnesses who are actually quite healthy in their mind and body and engagement with society. And there are probably quite a lot of us who think we're healthy and we're, we're not healthy at all. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a complex picture, but, but you touched on an important thing about the business models of Absolutely. health and healthcare. Um, and actually, business, business model from, from our perspective is, 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 is what ties together different dimensions of, of looking at and different perspectives from which one can look at healthcare. On, on one hand, you have the, the clinical dimension of, of micro level changes, um, the kind of eco efficiency that, that you were talking about, not, not being sufficient to really galvanize the change that we need. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the macro level um, systems, such as transportation, supply chain, um, and, you know, from up, up to the, the, the broader social and political spheres in which um, those systems and the healthcare systems that nest within them are situated. Um, so just to follow up on that, I was wondering what, from, from your perspective, the next steps forward in greening healthcare. Um, are they going to be from that micro level perspective I was talking about, um, from the, the business model perspective in the middle, or from a, a systems level? I mean, of course, all of these dimensions are important. What do you think is the focal point that should be used as a lever to really engender that, that revolutionary change you were talking about? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an almost impossible question. I suspect that it's, and this isn't very helpful, but I suspect it'll come from all three levels. It'll come from all three of them, and crucially, how the three interact with each other. So to give you a trivial example, and it's not necessarily a healthcare thing, you know, people say, is it individual actions that will address climate change, or is it government actions? Just that question itself. Well, of course, it's neither, and it's both. I mean, it's individual actions that will stimulate government, and it's government that will stimulate individual actions. So there's a there's either a vicious cycle downwards or a virtuous circle upwards. And, and we've got to obviously go for the virtuous circle upwards. So it's when, it's when you have top-down action at the same time as bottom-up action, which catalyze each other. And crucially, you remove the barriers in the middle. People always forget that it's in the middle. The, you know, the curse of middle management, as people would say in an organization. Um, where, you know, we'll all say, well, it's not primarily my job. <laughs> well, 
Well, it's everybody's job in a way. But the problem is when something is everybody's business, it ends up being nobody's business. That's the thing. So you do need a critical mass, a critical mass, the social movement. And that and that's one of the really important things that maybe we're not saying enough in terms of the healthcare system. Leo, you're absolutely right that if you objectively measure the emissions or the waste of a healthcare system, they're astronomically big. So on that count alone, it would be important, it is important for healthcare systems to step up to the mark and do what everybody else is doing. But there's another layer in healthcare systems which is very important because they're highly symbolic. That what a healthcare system does is highly symbolic of the society in which they lie. Healthcare systems employ about 10% of the working population. They they have they contribute to about 10% of the GDP. They're very widely distributed in every community in the land. It doesn't matter whether you talk about India or the UK or Brazil. They're they're in every community in the land. The people who work in them are normally quite highly respected and valued. So if you put all that together, it's both the direct actions of the healthcare service and just objective emissions or waste reduction or whatever it is, but it's also the normalizing, the societal normalizing effect of, of, of healthcare professionals and healthcare organizations and healthcare systems, that's your three levels, micro, meso, and macro, acting in unison to say, we do this, we see you at home, not in the hospital, we see you online, not in person, because it's better for your health. Oh, and incidentally, it's better for climate change, which is also good for your health um, via another route. So doing it symbolically, uh, doing it visibly rather, normalizes it from systems from your macro down to your micro. Yeah. I think that's a very important point, the, the collectiveness in our response. Um, and I, I wanted to mention something, this is from a medical student perspective, um, and I, I know of clinical audits, so, so I'm going to be talking about the micro levels here. So, so clinical audits, as you know, are done by medical students, junior doctors, consultants, um, and I guess we identify an issue, we uh, define our standards, we collect our data, put in an intervention, re-audit. And so at the GEI, we had an idea of um, potentially having um, environmental issues uh, within a healthcare system and using a clinical audit for clinicians to um, engage in. Uh, and so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that, really. And what kind of metrics can clinicians look for when, when looking at their sustainable practices within a hospital? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I really don't know the answer. One, one of the, although one of the things you remind me of is that a possible way, and I don't think we've ever done this particularly well, a possible way to normalize the whole idea of sustainability in healthcare is to either subtly or overtly introduce it as a quality, a dimension of quality, let's say. So you probably come across things like safety, efficiency, effectiveness, dignity, compassion, responsiveness. These are all dimensions of quality. You could look, you, when you do your audits, you can look at the care offered through those different lenses. And quite often, these lenses compete with each other. But, you know, they're rather competitive. But I always say that if you introduce sustainability as a dimension of quality of care, that would be very useful. It might be a quality of care working at the population level rather than the individual level, which makes it a challenge. Um, so that's one way of addressing your question. Another way of addressing your question in terms of, which I think is always the challenge, is integrating it. What, what Leo said when we, when we started this po podcast, which is the importance of the healthcare system and the business models that have wider context in other sectors like transport or education or what have you. So one of the use, it's, it's, I think it's quite useful to say in the healthcare system that we do in healthcare system what every sector is doing around the world, looking at environmental sustainability alongside financial sustainability, alongside social sustainability. And that's 
the so-called triple bottom line. Now, the importance of that is that you do not come across as a climate evangelist where you say, oh, climate is more important than everything else. It's more important than racism or migration or poverty or inequalities. It's not more important. It's part of the rich mix of challenges that we face. And that way, you know, facing, you know, avoiding extinction is a, then a rich mixture of collective action, not competing actions. Otherwise, we'll have a lot of people, including, you know, young, smart people like you, going around the world saying, my, my tragedy, my issue is more important than your tragedy or your issue. And that's not going to get us anywhere. So another issue I think is important to take is the interconnectedness of all these issues. That COVID and racism and oppression and gender inequality, in fact, all the all the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, they're, they're great in a sense, but it's how they're linked together, how the solutions we bring to these challenges address more than one. They have co-benefits. There are win-wins in space and in time and in you know. So win-wins over space and time. You know, it'll help this part of the planet, but it'll also help that part of the planet. It'll help now and it'll help in future. You know, marketing the win wins and not over focusing on the problems, I think is probably a, a part, an important part of the journey as we go forward. Uh, so allow me to briefly interject here um, because the, you know, you're bringing up the triple bottom line is, is just really so, so pertinent to, to kind of the com conversation we're having. Um, I mean, the context of, of our conversation is, is one month um, in the build-up to COP26. Um, and, you know, a, there's going to be a, a global conversation is, is going to be had effectively um, about, um, about the environmental dimension of, of, of sustainability um, moving forward. And in, in bringing healthcare into that conversation, we, we had been grappling with the idea of... of um, whether or not to prioritize environmental sustainability over the two other pillars um, of the three or the two other bottom lines. And you're bringing up that, in, from, from your perspective, combining the three in, into one and, and really strongholding that is, um, is the way to go. That is a really interesting way to look, look at things because it kind of reverses the logic that some might have of saying, yeah, well, I mean, of course, social sustainability is important and economic sustainability is important, but from the perspective of surviving, of actually you know, getting past the climate crisis and avoiding ex extinction, as you said, um, is the, the environmental climate or the environmental crisis stands alone. Um, I think there's even a single pillar idea that kind of champions that view. Um, so your, your pushback to that is, is, is really useful, I think, and, and something that well, um, food for thought. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, actually, because I think um, by using this multifaceted approach, we kind of, um, th those people who do not really take um, the issue seriously, we, we kind of um, make it a, leg a legitimate issue by raising the other pillars, which, which they um, may be more focused on. Um, and yeah, so I think that's a yeah, very good approach. And I think um, I, I didn't actually... Um, get to know about that during my medical education. I'm only in second year, but I think that can definitely be added because that, that does make you think very differently. Um, yeah. What you, what you, I mean, what you could, what you just reacted to or what you've just said is, is important in the sense that you could probably be more ambitious in this area than any of us might imagine. So, for instance, if you take the traditional graphic that you associate with triple line sustainability. It tends to be three equal circles, like a Venn diagram, overlapped. And in the middle is a sweet spot, which is where people say these are the co-benefits. Now, that may be not the best way to do it, in the sense that when you have a Venn diagram with three areas, it sets up a sort of weird and unnatural competition between them. You say, well, these, this has really great financial sustainability. This will keep the world economy going, which is much more important than environmental sustainability. 
and you know we don't care about social sustainability because there are always going to be poor people so <laughs> which is which is just a daft way of thinking about it if you redrew that graphic and i have done this before but i don't think i've done it particularly well so you take a large circle which is environmental sustainability a, a smaller circle wholly within it called social sustainability and a smaller circle again wholly within that called financial sustainability, then you get much closer to the notion of the, the economic system is a wholly owned subsidiary of the social system. And the social system is a wholly owned subsidiary all within the environmental. So if you had to prioritize something, you would therefore prioritize the environment on natural grounds, not, not hypothetical or competitive grounds. Because without an environment, you know, no planet, nothing. OK, no planet. Once you've got a planet, then you can have a social system. And actually, there are other ways. There are other ways of doing capitalism. There are lots of other ways of doing capitalism. I mean, we have a very crude way of doing capitalism. It's very unregulated. It's very non-future proof. It's very growth focused, all of which are bad for the planet. So we could have another modification of a much more well-regulated, equity-driven uh, economic system. And indeed, there are examples of that, like donut, eco donut economics. There are lots of examples of that. Um, but, you know, when I, when I look at the economic system that we are saddled with, that we've been bequeathed, that we hold up our hands and say, oh, there's nothing we can do. You know, you've got to remember that you got to remember that even people like John Maynard Keynes said that GDP is an artificial construct and it shouldn't be used for very long and it's not holistic. And we, we sort of worship it like a god. And there's no reason. It doesn't have to be this way. It does not have to be this way. Yeah, I think, yeah, very interesting thought there. Um, and I've got, I've got a question that I've uh, wanted to ask you for some time, really. Um, and so it, it's to do with something called um, Kuznet's hypothesis. So Kuznet was an economist and um, he, he proposed um, a theory in the 1950s. So this is pretty outdated. But what he said was, um, so you have GDP um, per capita on the x-axis and you have environmental degradation on, on the y-axis. And he kind of, he models it as a bell-shaped curve. So when you get to middle income countries, you have the highest uh, environmental degradation. After you reach that turning point or um, a cutoff point, you then start to reap the benefits of less environmental degradation. And, and would you agree with that uh, in, in healthcare? <laughs> Yeah, it's a good. It's a great idea, isn't it? It's a it's a nice it's a nice way of envisaging the future well and badly. I I mean, I have come across it. It has this. It ha has something that slightly worries me in it, chatting, which is that we have to go through this pain barrier whereby we're very high emitters, but we have to do that to get to the low emission, high wealth, high health world, and which means let's all hold our breath and see if we can get through this and then things will be okay. There are other alternatives to that, of course. And, and one is that, which I think is called leapfrog technology. is And you see it in Africa quite a bit, where, for instance, there are energy systems in Africa which have completely bypassed the fossil fuel bit and the grid bit. They go straight from nothing to having solar panels on their huts and their houses. So... I would sort of favor transformation from a low carbon, low wealth to a low carbon, high wealth stroke health without going through the bell shape, the peak of Kuznet. Um, whether that's doable or not, I don't know. There are plenty of examples of it, but it does lead into this idea of Another change model, which is very useful, very allied to Kuznet's Belka, which is the idea of the three horizon model. So we're at one, the first horizon. We want to be at the third horizon, but there's an intermediate stage called the second horizon. And that second horizon, I mean, you could call electric cars second horizon technology in that are they going to take us to the third horizon or are they going to reinforce the first horizon? Are they actually going to be counterproductive? Should we break out of cars altogether? 
should should we make individual mechanized transport a thing of the past and only only have it for goods distribution or emergency vehicles um and, and low tire cigarettes is another one is low tire cigarettes a good transition to no tire cigarettes or no cigarette or is it just reinforcing your first horizon so getting from where we are now to where we need to be to be fair and surviving you need to make sure that your every action you do is going to take you forward transformationally, not reinforce the world you're in, but in a slightly different way. And that's why you should never confuse efficiency with transformation. Trans efficiency tends to be making a bad world badder, worse in a, in a cleverer, more efficient way. We don't want a more efficient, bad world. We want a different world, actually. And sometimes we need to disguise those transformations that when they've happened, people will blink and say, what just happened? I didn't realize we'd changed. You know, the Internet revolutionized the world and people forget it. Mobile telephony revolutionized the world. We forget it sometimes. Wow, that's <laughs> the, the you're bringing up Bill Sharp and, and you know, the, the, the kind of the dynamics between um, fragmented healthcare, the transitional dynamic healthcare, and then the, the overarching relational transformational healthcare that kind of needs to take place at a human level is, is so pertinent to, to, you know, really where we are now in, in looking to transform systems it, where essentially we have to go beyond the micro eco efficiency practices, um, look towards system change, which, I mean, I think a lot of people, policymakers included, are now doing that. Um, and, and at GEI, we're trying to do that from a kind of a, a student <laughs> level, but obviously from a private sector perspective. And then, um, you know, that third dimension is, is really human related and human, human dynamics, human interconnectedness. Um, and that reminded me of one of the, one of the real barriers that, that I see to sustainability in in the healthcare sector and, and getting over that bell curve or avoiding that bell curve altogether um, really is that when you're talking about a you know, really high tech carbon intensive system, um, you know, when, when that sort of thinking is applied to a, an industrialized society in general, the efficiency gains that come from fragmented eco-efficiency practices, um, revolutionary um, new production methods, for instance, that bring that that reduction that ultimately creates the, the, the second half of the bell curve. Um, those are, those innovations take place within a, a system in which um, invention, uh, revolution, um, entrepreneurial activity is really incentivized. Um, and my view of, of healthcare is that one of the barriers there, and getting back to the human dimension I was talking about earlier with the Three Horizons framework, is that you really have a, a and, and Actually, sorry if I'm getting a bit uh, a bit abstract here, but you you are, you were talking about um, also the 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 dynamics of, of fast burn and um, you know urgent urgent action um, before important and um, so so really one of the barriers to innovation that I see is the imperative to preserve life that that is instantiated within healthcare and the fact that. Every micro innovation that takes place within the healthcare sector has to be done within the constraint of not impacting quality of care. Um, obviously, first, in the, you know, the first steps taken are always um, you know, sort, of, sort of prioritize those low hanging fruits that are the the perfect intersection within the Vi Venn diagram of um, patient care quality and um, and environmental efficiency, but when, as we start moving into the those those harder actions that are going to require, you know, properly re-envisioning the system and potentially creating some trade-offs between um, quality of care. Um, you know, one example of this could be decommissioning really energy-intensive processes, machines, and perhaps even pharmaceuticals that that aren't worth their weight in carbon, so to speak. Um, so to wrap to wrap that up and turn that all kind of into a into one brief question. Um, from just a medical ethics perspective, how do you think we draw that line in moving beyond um, 
fragmented green healthcare and into dynamic transformational healthcare? Gosh, <laughs> what a question. I think, well, first of all, I think just to, to link it with the previous points we were making, I think revolutions, good revolutions are sometimes disguised as evolutions. No one likes a revolution, but everybody likes a dramatic evolution, I guess. Um, I think as far, the second thing from an ethical point of view is you could probably argue that we do have a carbon budget, just like we have a financial budget, and actually carbon expended on good health care is carbon well spent. So we, we, I don't think we ought to dis health care too much. Um, it's just a question of the balance about health care. It seems to have removed itself from the argument of how on earth could health care be possibly harmful or inefficient or carbon intensive. Well, the truth is, it is a lot of, you know, a lot of health care hurts people. Um, I think one of the areas that's really interesting to think about, you might want to think about this, is the relationship between how we die well and our, and our footprint. So dying well is another, another thing the healthcare system does badly. We're, we're just not programmed to help people die well. Our metric is survival pretty much at all costs, actually, Prolong, prolongation of life pretty much all costs, whether it's financial cost or carbon cost or actually even human cost sometimes. So there's a very rich intersection about how we die well in a low carbon world. It sounds like a slightly weird issue, really. But we I mean, many years ago, we wrote a book about, you know, healthcare in a sustainable world. It was by far the chapter on dying in a green world, which received the most attention and interest and positive feedback, which which, which surprised us really, and and you know I don't regret agreeing to put that chapter in. That was that was really good. So I mean I think the the whole concept of what a healthcare system is is it a rescue system for things which we knew how to sort in the first place, or is it something? Does it promote health? Both promote health for the patient or the pre-patient, if you like. Promote health for the staff. You know, you've got to think that hospitals are not healthy places to work. I mean, they they burn you out. But also, are they healthy for society as well? I think another business dimension, which may be worth adding, is the fact that is the social value of healthcare systems in being big employers, big partners, big procurers. Um, so big employers. So healthcare systems, I think, can improve health even before they touch a patient by the way in which they operate. So there, is, there are so many dimensions and so many entry points for how you know, we, we started this conversation by looking at three ways, but actually there are probably four, five, six ways in which you, the, the whole you know, library is to be written and careers to be made over these, these intersecting dimensions. Um, but I mean, one thing I would applaud you in addressing is areas that other people are not addressing which is the link between healthcare systems and other sectors around the globe, and also the economic and business models, the economic incentives, and the way they they wrap into what does a good health and and I would say health and care system of the 21st century should be. Mm -hmm. Right, right, and. Just, I, I suppose, probably in, in closing, in, in, in addressing that point as well of economic models, one of the one of the dimensions that we've really been looking at from a from an entrepreneurial and economic perspective has been procurement. Um, one of the major categories of procurement, as as you know, is pharmaceuticals in healthcare, and um, looking at the dimensions there. Perhaps you you um, have ideas on that, John. Yeah. How, so yeah. So. Um... I guess it's clear that, um, so I read the Delivering a Net Zero NHS document, um, and it's clear that they account for a huge proportion of um, the carbon footprint when it comes to acute and primary care. And um, so I had an idea I wanted to discuss with you. So we, we know that NICE, when they um, approve a drug, they look at specific criteria such as um, the effects it will have on a patient. So. Um, quality, um, quality, um, quality assured, assured life years, 
um, cost, etc. And do you think um, environment, the environment um, and the effect drugs have on the environment and supply chain could be a specific criteria that could be introduced? And what would the drawbacks be if that was implemented? Yeah, good question. I mean, you've got to do all these things. You've got to start the conversation, and that's what I think you're doing, and I applaud you for doing that. To be honest, I think NICE already started the journey. And I think if you look at the NICE guidance, there is reference to the environment as being a determinant of health. So I think then they're, they're on the starting blocks. I don't think they're a long way down, but I don't think any of us are a long way down. But the, I mean, we, I think we had more success engaging nights when we were, you know, started the journey in the SPU than w almost with any other national organization, actually. And actually, it, it does have good leadership. I mean, Professor Lang, you know, if you, if you, you know, got an audience with her, she would be very interested to hear your thoughts about this. Not forgetting, of course, that you have a, as younger people, let's say, you have a different sort of moral authority to engage than you might not see yourself as well experienced or, you know, elder states people, but you have a moral authority in a different guise. And I think you should probably use that, you know, not 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 aggressively, but but clearly and assertively that whatever we do, you're going to live with the consequences longer than, you know, older people like me. So, you know, I would. I would take that question as a very important question, Justin, and and just you know ask for an audience with Professor Lang. She'd be very, I'm sure she'd be delighted to hear what you think. And and my word of advice, last word of advice, when you do these things, is to just to say, how can I help? Okay, how can I help? Because that's what everybody needs. They need help from each other. Because you know we've got to make one and one add three, not one and a half or half. Okay, so, and it's engaging. It's engaging. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's something. We'll... Yeah, no, no. I was, I was going to say that's something um, we should definitely pursue. Uh, I, I'm just writing um, the professor's name right now. <laughs> L-E-N-G. Um, yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's our next task, yeah. I think. Um, and yeah, I'll hand over to Leo. It's been an excellent conversation, yeah, really. Um, yeah, and yeah, we're very grateful to have you. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful speaking with you. Um, and I mean, you, you, you mentioned help. You, you certainly have been of, of huge help today in, in clarifying our thoughts and, uh, and hopefully our, our audiences as well. So um, thank you very much for, no, thank for joining you for us inviting today, me. Dr. Pension. And thanks, Jatin, for, for being on the call.